Ah,、uh, yes, the prince. The whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, not that prince. Sorry, you have to get out of the way here, buddy. This prince. This is Prince Anseis. Now, as you guys can tell from the title of the video, you guys already know what this video is going to be about. And before I start, if you guys are new, I like to make card game related content, mostly focusing on Gwent, but I will be adding some other card game. Types of videos here. So if you guys are new to the channel, please be sure to subscribe. If you guys are new, of course, and leave a like if you guys did enjoy this video. So let's go straight. Let's let's pretty much do with the elephant in the room. So Shield Wall. Shield Wall has been the talk of the month in terms of the most powerful leader ability that has been introduced. Now Shield Wall is one of the card, one of the leader abilities that got introduced when the update seven point two came in. At the beginning of this month, and honestly, it's already the talk of the town as being one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, leader ability in the game already. So, we are going to answer: Is Shield Wall truly powerful? And we are going to answer that question in the form of a deck guide. And already, be just by looking at this flowchart that I made, ah,、uh, it already screams problematic. And the reason for that is. Look at these arrows. If you guys are confused by the arrows, trust me, you're not the only one. When I first made this chart, I got really confused myself because it was hard to, you know, keep track of everything, every combo that was possible. In fact, I actually made last-minute additions before I even started recording because I know I think I did miss some combos that you guys were definitely gonna call me out on. I still think there's like a combo or two I'm missing out that you guys could call me out on. But again, a flowchart is just a representation of what I think in my head when I create decks, and this is this is pretty much what you guys see inside of my head. That's why it doesn't look clean. It looks very messy. It looks like it's all over the place. But honestly, I feel like most of you can actually relate to how I feel when I try to make these kinds of videos. But they're honestly fun to make, which is why I make them. Plus, it's it represents a clear visual representation as to the capabilities of this deck, and by the looks of it, it's a lot. Now, I am going to try and break this down to you the best way as I can, and the best way for me to say it in the shortest amount of words possible is. This deck is one of the most. It has the most synergy I've ever seen in a deck in a very long time. Now, when you got looking back, when I did my sort of first deck guide coming back because I took a bit of a hiatus doing RTS games and then I decided to come back to card games, I went to the monsters. And as you guys can see with the monsters, there were very clear indications on different combos in the deck doing very different jobs. For example, Osril's job was to obviously point slam and get his thing off while proccing thrive units. But then we have the section with the Wispus tribute, whose main job was to sort of control the board based on how the opponent was playing. So, for example, if they were going wide, you control it with Lacerate. If they're playing tall engines, you play Parasite to get rid of a valuable engine, etc. This deck, however, it all focuses around pretty much the same—not really the same thing, but like a very Common mechanic, which is boost. Now, when you cr when I hear of decks like control decks, boost decks, decks like that, I get reminded of card games like Hearthstone. Those are very generic、uh, types of decks, but they're super powerful.、Um, and which is which is exactly why this this leader ability on its own has been the talk of the month. Um, not only is it proactive because you can instantly slam it onto your Prince Anseis or Bloody Baron or your Frigate to protect them from most removal cards,、uh, then yeah, it's it's pretty much gonna cause mayhem and havoc.、Uh, now, of course, there's the thing is, oh, but people are gonna start putting control cards into their decks. Well, that's the thing, right? If that you start changing the deck just to counter a deck like this, you know it's a problem. When they purposely start adding squirrels to take out Amphibious Assault, when they purposely add、uh, Yeet Wave, or they start playing more Nilfgaard to play Turny Jaws just to counter the shield, or they put in a Yennefer's Invocation even though they might not be able to find room for it because they want to try out some other combo, you know it's a bit of a problem. When you're changing the face of the environment of the game, that is actually what makes a deck. Pretty, like pretty good, pretty bad. As in, like you're gonna see it every time, and it's not gonna look good. But you know that, that's 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 definitely a driving factor to it. So you guys have noticed that this majority blue arrows, but there are some white arrows. Let me explain that. 
If I had used a Dahlia, a Dahlia and Amphibious Assault have very similar targets. Uh, Amphibious Assault targets bronze units. Uh, obviously, they get boosted equal to the difference between their provisions and nine. And a Dahlia lets you summon a, lets you spawn and play a bronze unit. So they both pretty much have same bronze units target. But the white arrows are pointing to the cards that are specifically targetable by Amphibious Assault. And that's why Amphibious Assault is a very key card in this deck because it allows you to bring out Reynard, Anna, and Donamir, which are very crucial cards if they're missing pieces to your combo to make your long rounds even more brutal, then you can use Amphibious Assault. Not to mention you have a means of tutoring him out with John Natalis. That's really on only what John Natalis is there for. I do have Boiling Oil in this deck, which I didn't put because there's no sense in putting in one card because you guys know what it does. Why would I bother putting it in? I do have a backup in case that Amphibious Assault is already in hand. That way, John Natalis isn't bricked and he still has some sort of use in the deck. So I always make sure to have a backup. Uh, as you guys can see on the right side, it's a bit more clear, but at the same time, the power is still there. Shield Walls targets pretty much target any engine that does something passively. So again, the arrow pointing at Reynard is also pointing at Anna, but I didn't want to put in two arrows because look at how messy this flowchart already is. It's just going to get messier if I, if I literally included every single combo that existed. And I want to make sure you guys can read it. So I kind of put in like sort of the important ones and I'm just sort of explaining pretty much the missing parts that are still there and powerful. So, it can target, obviously, Reynard, Anna, if you want to protect them, Primarian Drummer, Frigate, if you want to protect them, etc. Eric Marine. It's a very defensive, it's a very defensive deck that's very, it has, which is a lot of offensive capabilities, which is honestly a problem. Uh, we also have, obviously, the Talk of the Town with Shield Wall is Prince on Sace. Now, I have seen versions that do run Seltkirk. I may try a variation with Seltkirk, but at the time that this video is being recorded, uh, I actually did not have that conversation with myself. Like, I, I didn't consider the considerations portion of the video. So at the time that I made this, I actually did not consider considerations. Like, as in, like, which cards to swap. I didn't add that. So I'm probably going to add it in the next video. But for this one, probably not at the meantime. Just because I, I wanted to get a video out by the weekend. So I wanted to go ahead and do this one for now. But in the future videos, you guys will see a consideration section where I will pick out specific cards that could potentially get swapped for other cards. If you guys want to try different combos, etc. Of course, you guys can leave your own suggestions in the comments below. And I don't mind responding to that one as well. So, yeah. Shield Wall, very powerful. Has a lot of targets. And the fact that it it grants shield just makes the engines last on the field a little longer. Now, of course, it gets countered by turn joust, and yada yada yada. But how many turn joust are there in a game? Two from from freaking Nilfgaard. That's pretty much it. Like, sure, Yennefer's invo. You even got Vincent. Now, Vincent is a big talk as well. I was like, oh, Vincent didn't just kill anything. Vincent's one card. It's only one card. If they choose to build around it by putting in a seer just to bring it back, if they know they're gonna take on like for example a shield wall, bring it, bring back Vincent, play him again, destroy. Sure, that the fact that they have to adjust their play because nobody plays that. Nobody should be playing that kind of crazy, insane combo unless something like this exists, which again kind of stems back to why it could be a problem. You know, now I'm not saying that that's what you should do. Obviously, depends on the situation. But if you guys find yourself taking on a lot of units with statuses that just you can't get rid of, you have to do something unorthodox in order to keep yourself just in the matchup, let alone try to win. So, as you guys can tell by the way I'm talking, it's already a bit of a problem. Um, the games, however, aren't gonna be as what do you call it? High profile as the power of this deck states. I mean, you guys will see. They're, they were more on the meme side of things in terms of who I was taking on, but they were still fun, so I didn't mind recording them and showing them to you guys. But you guys can already see what this deck is all about and where its power really stems from. In the long round, when I say just about anything on this chart, I really mean just about anything on this chart can be used as a long round card. Now, of course, there are certain cards you might want to keep to a mid to short round, so I've listed them out here on the right side. We got... Uh, Amphibious Assault into the Carrick Marine. Why I picked the Carrick Marine is because the Carrick Marine actually has the most power in a short round. Uh, it being a 7 point card. Not to mention you have the Amphibious Assault which adds 5 power. So it actually becomes a, a 12 point card in a short round. Uh, you also have Falibor of course which is a decent 10 points at least in a short round. Adalia into the 
a Royal City Guard, uh, sorry, Radovid's Royal Guard. I specifically picked the Royal Guard as an example because I did not want to pick the Carrick Marine again. Uh, just, or actually, no, I did put the Carrick Marine. So either the Royal Guard or the Carrick Marine. Again, just those extra boosts will work. So Adalia plus the Radovid's Royal Guard uh, grants you 7 points plus 2, which is 9 points for one turn. Uh, Carrick Marine is going to be 7 plus 3, which goes for 10 points, not to mention it has a shield. So those are pretty much the most powerful cards you get. Now, if you put a Carrick Marine, if you put a Carrick Frigate as the target, it's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, I'm assuming that it's 3... When I say short round, I mean three cards or less. Uh, with four cards, obviously, as the round goes longer, the round goes longer. Your more engine cards are going to have more value, such as the Temerian Drummer, the Carrot Frigate. But when I say short round, I'm talking about three cards, between three or four cards. I would, st I would say. Uh, but yeah, those are pretty much your short round options. Uh, your long round options, I put Anna, Stranger, and Slash or Reynard Odo. I did that because if you want to commit a super long round one, then you might want to play both and make sure they stay alive. That way you can win round one if you are on red and you pretty much give them a bit of trouble. If you lose, uh, if you're going to lose and if you guys know you're going to lose, make sure you have a bit of foresight because you want to make sure... You don't catch yourself playing all of your short round cards because even though I said that you can't play your long round card, your short round cards in a long round, you want to avoid that, of course. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're caught in a short round and uh, you played all your short round cards because that is a potential weakness, which I don't think I listed here, but I'm going to tell you that now so it's on the back of your mind. So that's pretty much everything I have to say about this deck. And uh, yeah, not much I can say. Uh, I, I can say any more other than that. So it's pretty much a cluster, uh, this flowchart, but you guys should be able to understand why the arrows were made like this and where they're pointing to and how the synergies work out. And other than that, let me take you guys over to some gameplay.
So we have now hit the sort of the back end of the video where we talk about the pros and cons total that I've noticed uh, after playing the games and making the flowchart. Pros, very powerful long round with a pretty decent short round. Again, the short round gets worse if you play your short round cards in a long round and you don't even end up winning. That's going to be problematic, of course. Abundance of engines makes board hard to control on the opponent's side. Like I said, if your opponent's going to make a super control based deck just focused on taking down shield wall, that's a problem. Like you're, you're having opponents create such really crazy decks that don't work for anything else other than this. That's a bad sign, I'm not going to lie. Strong synergy across almost all cards in the deck. That was proven by all the arrows you guys saw in the flowchart. So that's that. Now surprisingly for a deck that has... That is so powerful and that is the talk of like, please nerf this, please hotfix this. It has a bit of cons, believe it or not. Uh, flowchart was very hard to make. Now that was a personal con. It was very hard to make. And like I said, I had to add extra arrows at the end before I started recording. So there's that. Key cards cannot be tutored, such as Onsays, Baron, Varaxis, Falibor. You have to draw these cards. If you don't draw them, then you actually could be in a bit of trouble. But you have plenty of tutoring options, uh, options such as from Amphibious Assault. You got John Natalis into Amphibious Assault. So that's pretty much your only, like, don't, obviously they're not going to be used to thin out your best cards, but that is to thin your deck. That way your chances of drawing those cards are high. Even if the tutor card doesn't tutor specifically what you're looking for, it does thin the deck so that it increases your chances for the next turn. It's a bit more of a conservative play. Obviously, Oneromancy, you could not add here because otherwise you'd have to cut Carrick Marine because Carrick Marine already loses two value from that, so there's no sense. Uh, Varaxis has limited target options, so you want to be careful and make sure that your engines stay alive, at least, especially those that have order. So we're talking Carrick Marine, we're talking Onsays, we're talking Baron, we're talking Frigate. Now, of course, you want to use Varaxis for your gold, your gold order engines. Using them on a bronze order engine obviously decreases the value of Varaxis, of course. So that's what I mean when it has limited target options, but it still has quite a bit of options. And last but not least, this deck provides no counter for artifacts. How are you going to fit an Arin sorry, a Karafi Heatwave? I guess you could fit a Bomb Heaver, but again, Bomb Heaver is purely a tech card. So you can make that change if you want. But for the purposes of this deck that I made specifically, there are no counter for artifacts. Before I, I end this video off, I noticed that there is no deck list for this. So I will be sure to put a deck list uh, link on playgwent.com and I will link it to the video below. And I'll also be sure to post it on my Discord. So if you guys haven't joined me on my Discord yet, be sure to go hit me up on Discord and join my server. Uh, we, I haven't, it hasn't been that active, but I want to start kicking things up a little bit again. I have a few ideas in mind in terms of card games. And if you guys could get involved in the conversation, that would be pretty great. So that's going to be the end of this video. If you guys did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like and of course subscribe if you guys aren't new to the channel and you guys want to see more Gwent content. Other than that, this is Enzo signing out. I'll catch you guys in the next one.